Chapter Seventeen of Mister Trunnell, Mate of the Ship Pirate. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain, and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Mister Trunnell, Mate of the Ship Pirate, by T. Jenkins Haynes, Chapter Seventeen. "'If you'll pass the pannikin, I'll take a drink, sir,' said Jenks, after the sun had risen and warmed the chilly air of the southern ocean. I tossed the old man-of-war's man the measure, and he proceeded to draw a cupful from the water-breaker, which was full and lay amidships. "'It's an uncommon queer taste the stuff has, sure enough,' said he, after he had laid aside his quid and drank a mouthful. "'Try a bit, Tom,' he went on and passed the pannikin to a sailor next him. "'You're always looking for trouble, old man,' said the sailor, draining off the cupful. "'And bloomin' well ready to get out of it by any way he can,' added another. "'Fill her up again, and let me have some. This sun is most hot, in spite of the breeze. Blast me, Jenks, but you're a suspicious one. It's a wonder you ever go to sleep.' The young sailor, Tom, put down the cup and watched Jenks draw it full again. Then he grew pale. "'Hold on a bit with that water, you men. There's something wrong with it,' he said. He culped and placed his hand over his abdomen, while a spasm of pain passed over his features. "'My God!' he muttered, and doubled up. Then he vomited violently, and his spasms increased. I saw Chips turn white under his tan and Johnson looked with staring eyes at the water-breaker, as though it were a ghost. "'Knock in the head,' I said, "'and let's see what's inside of it.' Two men held the poor fellow gasping over the rail while his agony grew worse. The rest crowded around aft as much as possible to see what terrible fate was in store for us. The breaker was upended in a moment. Jenks stove in the head with an oar-handle, and we peered inside. The water was a clear crystal, like that in the sovereign's tanks. It was not discoloured in the least. "'Pass the baler here,' I said, and then turn the barrel so we can get the sunlight into it. I bailed out a few quarts, looked at it carefully, tasted it slightly, and then put it carefully back again. I noticed a strange acrid taste. The barrel was turned towards the sun and its light was allowed to shine straight into its depths. I put my head down close to the surface and peered hard at the bottom. Then I was aware of a whitish powder which showed against the dark wood. Reaching down, some of this was brought up, and then I recognized the same powder Captain Sackett had told me was bichloride of mercury. By this time Tom was in convulsions. He strained horribly, and we could do nothing to relieve his agony. Brandy was given, but it did no good, and finally he lost consciousness. Miss Sackett nursed him tenderly and did all she could to make him comfortable, but it was no use. The horror of the thing fairly took my senses for a moment. There we were, miles away from land, without water. The villains had met us to tell no tales. All adrift in an open boat, with food and water poisoned, we had a small chance, indeed, of ever telling the story of the sovereign's loss. Vessels were not plentiful at the high latitude we were in, and, as we were out of the trade, it was doubtful if we could even get into the track of a regular cape route inside a week, to say nothing of being picked up. It seemed as though Andrews's villainy would finish us yet. Far away, on the southern horizon, the single mast stuck up above the blue water like a black rod. I stood up and gazed at it. Chips appeared to read my thoughts, for he spoke out, "'Tis no use now, sir. The tanks would be a couple of fathoms deep, and we couldn't get at them. She won't float more in a day or two, anyhow, with the after-deck and cargo burnt free. She'll go under as soon as the oil's washed out with a sea, and that'll be the last of a bad ship.' I saw that the carpenter was right. There was no water for either Andrews or ourselves, and it would be foolish to go back to force the tank. "'Heave the stuff overboard,' I said, and Johnson and Jenks raised the barrel upon the rail. It poured out clear into the blue ocean, and showed no sign of its deadly character. 
"'Break out that barrel of ship's bread,' said Chips. It was found to be moistened with water all through, and as even the little poison I had drunk may be horribly nauseated, there was no thought of tasting the stuff. Over the side it went, floating high in the boat's wake. Then came the beef. "'Hold on with that,' said Miss Sackett. "'It isn't likely they'd poison everything. I don't remember there being over several pounds of that mercury in the medicine chest, and you know it won't dissolve readily in water. They must have had something to dissolve it in first, and would have taken too long to fill everything full of the stuff.' "'Who cares to taste the beef?' I asked. "'Give me a piece, sir,' said Johnson. He put it in his mouth and chewed slowly upon it at first, as though not quite certain whether to swallow it or not. Finally he mustered courage and made away with a portion of it, waiting some minutes to see if it produced pain. It was apparently all right, and then he swallowed the rest. We concluded to keep the beef and eat it as a last resort. The breeze freshened in the southeast, and we ran along steadily. If it held, we could make about a hundred miles a day, and raise the African coast within a week. There was a chance, if we could stand the strain. It was now the sixth day since we had left the pirate, and we figured that she must have rounded the Cape, and would now be standing along up the South Atlantic with the steady southeast trade behind her. Other ships would be in the latitude of Cape Town, and if we could make the northing, we might raise one and be picked up. I pictured the horrors the poor girl sitting beside me must endure if we were adrift for days in the whaleboat. What she had already gone through was enough to shake the nerves of the strongest woman, but here she sat, quietly looking at the water, her eyes sometimes filled with tears, while not a word of complaint escaped her lips. Her example nerved me. I had passed the order to stop all talking except when necessary, as it would only add to thirst. We ran along in silence. We had no compass save the one hanging to my watch-chain, as big as my thumbnail, but I managed to make a pretty straight course for all that. The wind freshened and was quite cool. The sunlight, sparkling over the ocean, which now turned dark blue with a speck of white here and there to windward, warmed us enough to keep off actual chill, but the men who had taken off their coats to make a little more of a spread to the fair wind soon requested permission to put them on again. Sitting absolutely quiet as we were, the air was keener than if we were going about the sheltered decks of a ship. On we went, the swell rolling under us and giving us a twisting motion. Sometimes we would be in a long hollow where the breeze would fail. Then, as we rose sternward, the little sail would fill, and away we would go, racing along the slanting crest of the long sea, the foam rushing from the boat's sides with a hopeful, hissing sound, until the swell would gain on us and go under, leaving the boat with her bow pointing up the receding slope, and her headway almost gone, to drop into the following hollow and repeat the action. The English sailor who had drank the water was now stone dead. Johnson gave me a look, and I began a conversation with Miss Sackett, endeavouring to engage her attention. A splash from forward made her look, and she saw what had happened. Then she turned and, looking up at me, placed her soft little hand on mine, which lay upon the tiller. "'You are very good to me, Mr. Rolling, but I can stand suffering as well as a man,' she said. "'I thank you just the same.' Then her eyes filled, and she turned away her face. I found something to fix at the rudder-head, and when I was through she was looking over the blue water where the lumpy trade-clouds showed above the horizon's rim. As the day wore on, the hunger of the men began to show itself. Jenks kept his wrinkled leather face to the northward, looking steadily for a sail but the other sailors glanced aft several times, and I noticed the strange glare of the eye which tells of the hungry animal. Some of these men had eaten nothing for twenty-four hours. One big, heavy-looking young sailor glanced back several times from the clue of his eye at the girl sitting aft. But I fixed my gaze upon him so steadily that he shifted his seat and looked forward. 
Late in the afternoon some of the men insisted on eating the beef, and it was served to them. No ill effects followed, so all hands took their ration. This satisfied them for the time being, but I knew the thirst which must surely follow. I had been adrift in an open boat before in the Pacific. There had been sixteen men at the start, and at the end of four weeks of horror seven had been picked up to tell a tale which would make the blood curdle. The memory of this made me sick with fear and anxiety. Johnson felt so much better from his meal that he stood in the bow with his little monkey-like figure braced against the mast, his legs on the gunwales. He said jokingly that he'd raise a sail before eight bells in the afternoon. Suddenly he cried out, "'Sail dead ahead, sir!' "'Tis no joking matter,' growled Chips angrily. Shut your head, ya monkey, afore I heave you over the side. Johnson turned fiercely upon him. Joking, you lummox! Slant your eye forwards, and don't sit there a-looking at yourself, he snarled. Steady there, I cried. Where's the vessel? Right ahead, sir, and standing down this ways, if I see straight. I stood up on the stern locker and looked ahead. Sure enough, a white speck showed on the northern horizon— but I couldn't see enough of the craft's sails to tell which way she headed. The men all wanted to stand at once, and it took some sharp talk to get them under control. But the young girl at my side showed no signs of excitement. I looked at her, and her gentle eyes looked straight into mine. "'I knew she would come,' she said. "'I've prayed all the morning.' In twenty minutes, spent anxiously watching her, the ship raised her topsail slowly above the line of blue, and then we saw she really was jammed on the wind and reaching along toward us rapidly. "'Tis the pirate, no mistake!' cried the carpenter. "'Look at them rails! No one but the bit of a mate Trunnell ever mastheaded a yard like that!' "'The pirate!' yelled Johnson from forward. And so indeed it really was. I looked at her and then at the sweet face at my side. All the hard lines of suffering and fright had left it. The eyes now had the same gentle, trusting look of innocence I had seen the first morning we had taken off the Sovereign's crew. The reaction was too much for me. I was little more than a boy in years, so I reached for the girl's hand and kissed it. When I looked up I caught the clue of Jenks's eye, but the rest were looking at the rapidly approaching ship. End of chapter 